Psalms 43. We're going to read all five verses. The Bible says, Judge me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now, in these verses, first, verse number one, we find his petition. Judge me. Judge me, O God. Show me. Teach me. Enlighten me. But then we also see his predicament. He says, plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Now we're going to stop here for a second. Deal with verse number one, then we'll get to the rest of it. Now he's saying... God, do something for me that I cannot do for myself. He's saying, plead my case against an ungodly nation and deliver me from deceitful and unjust man. Now, this guy knows God. I mean, in Old Testament terms, we certainly could say that he had salvation, not as we know it today, but he would have gone to Abraham's bosom. That he'd have been waiting there for Jesus to show up one day with the blood that he shed on Calvary when he led captivity captive. Okay, this guy knew God. But he's saying... Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me. Well, where is he? He knows God, but he's in the midst of ungodly people. I mean, anybody ever feel like you go outside and you, feel, you deal with deceitful and unjust men? A deceitful and unjust world? Well, what's deceitful? Deceit is trying to get benefit for yourself by doing harm to other people. You want riches at others' expenses. You don't necessarily want to put the hard work and the effort into reaping your own goods. You want to take them from other people that have done the work. But what's unjust? Well, there's a lot of things that unjust can be. Certainly unjust is sinful. Certainly it's unrighteousness. But really all it means is wrong. People that are wrong. They wrong you. They wrong others. They may wrong themselves. But he's in the midst of a people that know nothing about God. That's why he said, plead my case against an ungodly nation. He's asking God to show others that he's right and they're wrong. Not for his own sake, but for God's sake. He said, judge me, Lord, examine me, throw me into the fire. I mean, Job said, you know, I shall come forth as gold because he tried me, because he put me in the fire. All the impurities will be taken away. He said, God... If i got to go through the fire, put me through the fire. If everything's good right now, simply display the good that is within me, that you've put within me, and plead my case or show other people what I cannot show them. People that don't know God aren't seeking after God. Unjust man is not seeking for God's opinion on things. A deceitful person doesn't want to do the things of God because they would show them that they're doing wrong, that they're unjust. So he's saying, Lord, try me. Put me on trial publicly in front of other people so that you can plead my case to them to show them that what they're doing is wrong. Now this is a, you know, it's not uncommon, but it's one of them songs. We don't know who wrote this song. You're going to stay, we don't even find, you know, what it was written for, whether it was a psalm of praise, whether it was a psalm of mourning. We don't know when it was penned. We just know that somewhere, somewhere, or somewhere, at some time, this guy wrote this psalm, begging God, show ungodly people how godly you are through me. Not for my sake. I mean, he knows God. He's not praying for his own sake. He's saying, show an ungodly people that you are God. And if I have to be the reason or the way that you show those people, that's fine. You can destroy me. He's God. Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Because he is God. I mean, that was the fourth word that he said. Judge me, oh God. Not judge me, government. Not judge me, friends and family. Not judge me, church family that knows me real good. God, put my life on display. Open up those inward things and make them outward. Because man looketh on the outward appearance. God looketh on the heart. 
He's saying, make known those private things so that others can see what is the good thing, what is the right way. So he's a godly person living amongst the ungodly. He may be exactly where God wants him to be. He could be in the midst of deceitful men, maybe like Jeremiah. The unjust man that once knew God, but now they don't know. He could be right smack dab in the middle of God's will. He could be praying this because he got out of God's will. He's saying, judge me, oh God. God, I don't know how I ended up among all these ungodly people, but judge me so I can get back to the godly people. Show me where I went wrong so I can go back to doing right. He also could be praying this, maybe not because he did wrong, but because he trusted in someone that led him wrong. Any, anybody ever put faith in someone, said they were going to do the right thing, didn't do the right thing, and you were caught holding a bag? Anybody ever been there? Well, I mean, the Bible does say not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I believe that that goes further than just marriage. I believe it goes along with business. I believe it goes along with friendships. We are a separate people. We are a called out generation, a royal priesthood. But we are in this world. We're not part of it, but we're in it. And your boss may not be godly. You may be planted in an ungodly place, and every now and then you're going to feel like God lets you be led astray. Those thoughts where he's thinking, God, maybe his soul, maybe his heart, maybe his flesh is saying, God forgot about you. You got caught holding the bag. And he's praying, God, I know my flesh is wrong. Show me that you're still God. I believe that you're God. He calls him God. He says, judge me, O oh God. He's saying, help my unbelief. Help that part of my flesh that's doubting whether or not it's your will that I be here. So verse number two, he says, for thou art the God of my strength. Again, he believes he's God. He believes that God is his strength. He knows where his strength cometh from. I mean, the, another psalmist said, I will look towards the hill from whence cometh my help. I know God's my strength. God's my refuge. God's the one that allows me to take breath every day. But he's saying, for thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Now, if we read that in the flesh, we think, well, God, why'd you get rid of me? That's not what he's asking. He's saying, God, what caused you to have to cast me off? Was it something I did? Was it something that somebody else did and I followed them? Is this your will that you didn't cast me off, but show me that you've put me in a place where, like Job, I looked to the east, looked to the west, looked in front of me, looked behind. He couldn't find God, but he knew that God was still there. Right. He's saying, God, show me, just reassure me. Help that part of me that doubts. And even though I can't see it, just give me the assurance that I'm right where you want me to be. Show me that you didn't cast me off, that I'm still in your hand and his hands and the Father's hand. No man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Just remind me again, because I am human. Because I do have an unsaved mind, an unsaved heart. This flesh does fight against me. Lord, just give me the assurance that in my weakness, just comfort me. Give me that strength. Because you're my strength. I can't rely on myself. So just give me another verse. Remind me of the verse that you once gave me. Bring to remembrance in this land where I'm surrounded by ungodly people. Just give me a little haven of godliness. He's saying, why dost thou cast me off? Is it something I did? Is this your design? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Well, what's oppression? That is, essentially, someone keeping you down, loading you with things with the intention to break you. The children of Israel suffered oppression while they were in Egypt. Egypt tried to break them with bondage. But their bondage only brought them closer to God. He says, why go I mourning? Oppression's not an enjoyable thing. His soul mourns for the fact that God, I'm bearing this burden, but I know that you can help me bear it. He doesn't request that the burden be removed. He's just saying, Lord, help me endure it. Because, again, we've got those situations. If he's right in the middle of God's will, he knows it's God's will for him to bear it. So, Lord, help me do thy will. If he's found himself in a situation that because of disobedience or sin or iniquity that he's away from God, Lord, I know I must reap what I sow, but Lord, 
show me where I went wrong so I can bear this burden back to the house of God and unload it that I can get things made right with you and then if it's simply life if it's one of those things that we all must deal with we all have thorns in the flesh Paul prayed for it to be removed God said my grace is sufficient for thee he's saying Lord my soul is oppressed because of this thing that I know you've given me for your honor and your glory help me bear it show me how your strength is made perfect in my weakness show me how to embrace your strength and lean not on my own understanding Lord you told me that if any man lack wisdom let him ask of God which gives all men liberally Lord give me that wisdom give me that understanding to help me bear this thing all the way to heaven if I have to lob off a leg I'd rather walk into heaven lame if I have to lob off a hand I'd rather walk into heaven maimed than walk into heaven holding on to everything that I wanted instead of embracing what God wanted I'd rather be blind I'd rather be deaf I'd rather be mute and be in the smack dab perfect will of God but then verse number 3 he says oh send out thy light and thy truth let them lead me let them bring me into thy holy hill into thy tabernacles he's saying God I know where the answer is just show me well what is the word of God well another psalmist again word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path he's saying send out thy light keep in mind he lived in a time where the word of God hadn't been completed he's saying Lord whether it's through speaking directly to my heart through the angel of the Lord the Old Testament is the Holy Spirit that's Jesus okay speak to me in person speak to me through a man through a prophet through a priest through someone that knows your word but send out thy word so that what I can tell everybody that I know more than they do about the Bible or the things of God no it says send out thy light and thy truth let them lead me Lord I'm in darkness but I also know that light shined in darkness and darkness comprehended it not if God shows up darkness has to go away and what makes the word of God a light because it is truth you know what dispels deceitfulness truth you know what dispels unjust people truth you know what dispels sin or iniquity in our heart? The light of truth. And where do we find it? Right here. And what he delivered unto us. And what he promised to preserve until he came back. What's forever settled in heaven because it's that true. The very thing that he said we could stand on. It's one of my favorite songs as a kid still is to this day. Standing on the promises. Why? Because heaven and earth shall pass away but his word shall not pass away. He's saying, Lord, I may know the passage that you already want to bring to my mind, but Lord, I may have forgotten. It may be that I've read it a hundred times, but I haven't read it for this particular situation. There are times that God shows me what I need out of a verse for the moment. Why do you think the psalmist said, daily will I seek thee? Because there's another nugget in here I need for today. I'm not worried about tomorrow necessarily. I mean, do I make plans that if tomorrow comes, I'll know what to do? Yeah, but tomorrow is not promised. It's not guaranteed. Lord, I need what I need for today so that I can be in your will. He's saying, send your light so that maybe just for one more day I can walk among unjust and deceitful men. Lord, this may be my last day on earth. I don't want to die with sin and iniquity in my heart. Send your light to show me what I need to repent of. What separates you and me? Or Lord, I'm doing my best to bear this load. Just give me what I need. Give me the truth, the encouragement, the edification that I can go another mile today. Because Lord, you compelled me to go a mile. I want to go two. I want to go three. I want to go four. Because I love you that much. But then he says, in verse number three, let them bring me into thy holy hill, into thy tabernacles. That's the thing about the Bible. God's always going to point you to God. Best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. I don't care what man says. I want to know what God says about the Bible. But where do you find that out? Well, he says, well, let them lead me. That was the first part. But he says it's going to bring me into the holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Well, what's the tabernacle? That's the house of God. It's the place where God dwells. 
It's not where God lives, that's heaven. He rules and reigns from on high. But every now and then, he just chooses to visit man in tabernacles. Well, later they ended up calling them temples. New Testament tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the tabernacle. We know that the house of God isn't made with human hands, but every now and then he chooses to sit down among us in this tabernacle. That his presence is made known here. So what's the psalm is saying here? He's saying, whether, Lord, you want to meet with me privately, or whether you want to meet me openly in the congregation among your people, wherever you want to give me the answer, Lord, just lead me there. But then he also says, lead me to your holy hill. A lot of times you'll find that in the Bibles is a reference to those places where God met with man and delivered God's very word to man. The mount where Moses received the original Ten Commandments and then where he had to go back up and etch them again because he threw them down and broke them. What happened on that mountain? God came down and sat with Moses. What happened at the burning bush? God came down through the person of the angel of the Lord in the bush, met with Moses. His face was glowing by the time he came back down off that mountain. They had to put a bag on his head because they couldn't stand to look at him. It was so shiny. Right? Well, what happened when Moses in the Ten Commandments? The earth shuddered and shook. There were lightnings and thunderings. There were loud noises and it terrified the unjust and the deceitful men of Israel. He's saying, God, wherever you've got to get me, whether it's a place alone, whether it's a place where your people are gathered, whether it's just in my heart, meet with me and reveal unto me what it is that you want me to do. Because see, it's one thing to get in here and know what to do. It's another place to say, Lord, send thy light so it can lead me and bring me. You know what that is? That's not just asking, that's seeking. Amen. He did say, seek my face. He's saying, Lord, reveal unto me what separates you from me, whether it's sin, whether it's your design, and I'm just going through a test right now. I mean, as Brother Greg told us last time, you know, a test, teacher's not there. You can't ask questions during the test. The test is to figure out how much you know, how well you listen to what the teacher already said. They may not say anything. They may not answer your questions, but they're always in the back of the room somewhere. They're always watching. Lord, if this is a test, just show me what I need to know to get through the test. Bring to my remembrance the things that you already taught me, that I was faithful to hide in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Or, Lord, I did fail you. Show me how to get back to where you are. Or there's a burden that I have, Lord, that in the flesh I cannot bear. But give me the strength to bear it as far as you'd have me take it. Get back to where you can strengthen me again to go another mile. I don't want to grow weary in well-doing. I don't want to become, as the Apostle Paul said, cast away. To where I leave my burden on the side of the road and I get to heaven and someone's blood's going to be required at my hands because I wasn't faithful enough to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Lord, help me. He's like, lead me. Bring me to the place where I can get what you want me to have. Because see, the prodigal son came to himself in the pig pen. But he didn't get what the father wanted for him until he got back to the father's house. He knew what he had done wrong but he didn't get the blessing of the Father until he got back to the Father's house. Right. Amen. Just because you know God doesn't mean God's going to meet with you where you're at. Right. 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 He says, show me what I'm doing wrong or show me how to get back to the things of God because I know I can't meet with God unless I'm on God's terms. Yeah. I've got to get to where God would want to meet with me at. God didn't give Moses the Ten Commandments in Egypt. They had to get to the wilderness. They had to get to the holy hill of God in order to get the word of God the instructions from God but we're the same way we may come to the house of God this is a place of edification this is a place of building up of strengthening this is a place where God may give the pastor a message to correct us but there is a place I mean my favorite verse in the Bible Psalm 91 1 he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty you've got to do business with God in secret in order to dwell openly in the shadow of God. To get so close to God that His shadow's over you all the time. That's not done out and open. That's done inwardly, in private, in secret. Because those things done in secret, God rewards openly. Okay, but we'll keep going. Verse number four. 
and saying, after your light comes, after thy truth comes, and you lead me back to the house of God, to the things of God, to where God wants to meet with me, he says, then will I go to the altar. He's saying, all right, I'm back at the Father's house. That doesn't mean everything's good. There's business to do. Amen. He's saying, whatever it was that was out there, if it's the call of God that led me into a deceitful world, I may get back into the altar and say, Lord, stir up that fire that's shut up in my bones like Jeremiah. Jeremiah wanted to quit, but he couldn't because God had been too good to him. Because he realized that it wasn't a friend that asked him to do something. It wasn't a Lord that asked him to do something. It was the very God of all creation that asked him to take that message to Israel. It was a burden. It was a fire shut up in him. He couldn't shake it. Well, there may be days you say, Lord, I, my flesh doesn't want to. But I do know that he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. I know that I can compel this flesh. Lord, just give me a little bit of extra drive. Right? Give me that spiritual diet Mountain Dew. A little bit of caffeine to help me get through this. Right? Give me a song. Give me a word of praise that I can take that will inspire my soul to compel the flesh to do what you'd have me to do. Or, Lord, I know that you showed me what was wrong. And you brought me to the place where I can get business done with. I mean, that's like being sick. Knowing that you're sick after you've denied it for about four days. And then now you got a fever. And it's like, well, I might as well go to the doctor. You go to the doctor, you get the prescription, but you never go to the pharmacy. This is God leading you to where you can do business, but you get to the altar and you stare at it and don't do anything. If there's sin, if there's iniquity, and it goes unconfessed, God's not going to even hear your prayers. Sin, literally, if we break it down, is separation from God. He's saying, Lord, if I, in this midst of this wicked people and this ungodly nation, if it's my fault that I got here, show me what I did wrong, Take me back to the house of God so I can address it. Get it made right. Something always dies at the altar. So let's look at those three situations again. If it's a thorn in the flesh, what is it? I may have to kill my pride. Well, God, I don't deserve this. Says who? I've been bought with a price. My life's no longer my own. If it's the, birth, if it's the ministry of God that took me to that place. If I'm not wrestling with my flesh, if I'm wrestling with what God's given me, what do I have to kill? Maybe I have to kill my expectations. Lord, this isn't the way that I thought my life was going to go. Come on. Let's look at Jeremiah again. A prophet of God. This is one of God's men. He's saying, Lord, I'm in the stocks. They're throwing stuff at me. They put me in jail. Look at the apostles. All of them but John died a martyr's death. You think in the flesh, every now and then they didn't just question, well, Lord, why are you killing us all off? They were doing the right thing. But do you ever find them asking that? No. Peter even thought, hey, I don't deserve to be crucified like Jesus. Hang me upside down on a cross. Andrew said, don't, don't crucify me up there. Lay mine on the side. That The flag of Scotland, that's Andrew's cross. What is it? I don't deserve to be even compared to Christ. But if you want to associate with me, I'll be more than happy. Yeah. Christians did not call themselves Christians. That's why you don't find Jesus ever used the word. They were called Christians at Antioch because they lived like Christ. So Lord, whatever in me needs to die so that I can be Christ-like, I'm going to put it on the altar. But then if it's sin, Lord, let's get this on the altar so that sin can die. The flesh can die. Because I want that new creature. I don't want the old man. If I need to take those clothes that I tried to put back on that used to be attached to me, but Jesus cleansed me of them, took them off of me, gave me a new robe and a crown. If I went back into the world tried to put those clothes back on, I may have to throw those clothes onto the altar and burn them. I may have to throw what I wanted to put on that separated me from God. And instead of putting on ungodliness, take it off, throw it on the altar, and then once again, choose to put on godliness. Because the whole armor of God will help you if you put it on. We've been robed in His righteousness if we allow Him to put the robe on us. But if in self, in the flesh, if I choose, I don't want to wear that robe, then God will let me take the robe off. He's not going to force me to put it back on. But in order to get it back on again, I've got to burn whatever clothes I thought were better. That's called repentance. Taking it off and hanging it up in the closet, that's not repentance, that's saving it for another day. 
That's a different outfit. But to come back and say, Lord, I know I don't need this. So I'm going to burn it on the altar. To show you that I'm serious about putting that robe back on. If you ever get to the point that you just junk everything but God, you'll get desperate for the things of God. I used to use, this is one of my favorite terms back in the day when I was doing all that debating and stuff in school. Desperation breeds dependency. If you don't have water, the person that gives you water, you're going to become dependent on them. If you can't feed yourself and somebody gives you a meal, you'll become dependent on them. Well, if you become desperate for the things of God, you'll become dependent on the things of God. Doesn't matter what I can give myself. God may have blessed me that I don't need to worry about where my next meal is going to come from. But if I stop being desperate for God's blessings, God's goodness, God's fellowship, God's relationship, then I won't be, be dependent on God. I'll put on a set of the whole armor of God. I'll put on a nice suit of, you know, fleshliness, worldliness, carnality. And what's that do? Man cannot serve two masters. I love one and hate the other. When I put on self, when I put on the world, I'm saying, this is what I need to get through the rest of the day. And God's going to say, that's going to lead you into an ungodly nation full of deceitful and unjust men. And I may not heed the red warnings, or the red flags and the warnings. And if I do end up there, and one day I look around and say, where's God? God's right where I left him. But in order to get back to God, i got to junk what I embraced that led me away from God. Where's that done? At the altar. But then notice what he calls the altar. He says, Then while I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. He's saying something has to die at the altar, but it's joyful. Why? Because if I draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to me. You do realize that if we put on ungodliness, if we put on the flesh, if we put on sin and iniquity, God didn't give that for it. We had to go looking for it. Because in the new creature... He gave us everything we need. He made us a king and a priest. A king to rule and reign over the flesh. A priest that we can enter directly into the throne room of God and pray. Don't have to go through anybody else. There's one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. Amen. He gave us everything we needed. So if we sought something else, it meant that we cut ourselves off from our joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He said God is my strength. Why was God his strength? Because God delighted in his life. But when God stopped delighting in his life, he had no more strength. He had no more joy. He had no more peace. He had no more mercy or grace. By God didn't cut the spigot off. He just moved to where he couldn't receive the blessing anymore. I mean, if I've got a bucket, and there's water right here, if I go over here, I'm not getting any water in the bucket. It wasn't God's fault. It's his fault. Well, he's saying, I'm going to go to the altar of my exceeding joy. Because I know here, this is where I get back what I threw away. Even though I don't deserve it, I know if I get to the altar, God will give back to me the things that I said, uh, Lord, I don't want that. The father in the story of the prodigal son still had a robe. Didn't give him the junk one, gave him the best one. Put a ring on his finger. You know what that means? That identified him with the father. That's a signet ring. That, that's the family crest in the middle of the ring. He's saying, this one's mine. Amen. He still got it. But in order to get it, i got to get rid of what I want. When you become miserable with what you've got, that's when, when you get to the things of God, you're going to be full of joy. Because you realize everything you wanted was empty. It was vain. It was hollow. Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. He said he looked at the whole world and it was empty. There was nothing in it. Why? Because it wasn't of God. But he said, the things of God... Those endure for forever. There is joy in those things. Because they weren't made with sinful and human hands. They were crafted by the potter. They were made by the carpenter. And they will endure for forever. That's why it's a joy to get back to the altar. If you really appreciate it. It's a place that you'll want to go to daily. Some, maybe sometimes more than once a day. Because you don't want to lose those things that God has given to you. It says, yea, on the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. He hadn't even got to all these things yet. He hadn't even received the light yet. He's still praying for it. He hadn't received the directions to get back to the house of God. He hadn't received 
you know, the altar, the place of repentance yet. But he's saying, just the thought of it, I'm starting to get a little happy. <laughs> he's saying, Lord, before you even give it, I'm going to start praising you. Because he's saying, well, if God gave me the burden to get here, God's still doing something. That's worth praising. Yeah. If this is a thorn in the flesh, it means the devil's fighting. The flesh is fighting. That means God wants to do something. Or if he was in sin, that doesn't change who God is. God still deserved to be praised. They're saying, I'll sing unto you even if you choose not to take me back. Because you deserve it. Because you're worthy of it. You didn't lead me here. I led myself here. Then we get to verse number 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Now he's rebuking himself. He's saying, why did I even for a second entertain the fact that God had forgotten about me? God knew right where I am. I may not know where God is, but God always knows where I am. And let's be honest, if you're a child of God, you know how to get back to the Father's house. The thing is, you just may not be able to get yourself to the Father's house. They're saying, so why are you cast down? He may have been out in this deceitful place, whether it's something that he did, whether it was the design of God, whether it's a thorn in the flesh. Let's look at Mephibosheth. Son of Jonathan, son of Saul. His granddaddy was the former king. David comes into power. Mephibosheth was taken away from the house of God, away from the house of his own father, hidden away out in the world because they thought that was the safest place for him. There's times that your flesh is going to say, no, 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 the best place we can be is out there. There's times that the devil is going to put a thought in your mind that says, best place you can be is right over there. And you get over there, what are you going to be? You're going to be miserable. And there's nothing that you can do for yourself. Mephibosheth didn't take himself there. He was crippled by a fall. What's that? That's sin. Sin crippled us to where we could not go to God. Mephibosheth knew, I need something. May not have even known what it was. But he knew that out there in Lodabar, there was no way that he could help himself. He was completely reliant on what other people could do for him. He couldn't work for a living. He couldn't go out and labor. He could not earn what he needed. But we're the same way. I cannot earn the grace of God and the mercy of God. I can't even, under my own power, come to the house of God and expect anything from God. Even if I could get to where God was, if I don't come in the right spirit, can't do anything for myself. You do realize that that's why Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world? Because he had to come because we could not go to where he was. Because we were cursed with sin, our own prayers and petitions wouldn't have even been heard of God. Because we were so, literally, dejected. We were so cursed that we didn't even show up on God's radar. But he chose to love us anyway. David said, hey, is there anybody that remains of the house of Saul? And he said, yeah, you know Jonathan, that guy that you was pretty good friends with? He's got a son. But because God had a relationship with the son, and the son, through his blood, begat us, the father says, go get him and bring him to my house. Let him sit at my table. I'm going to feed him for the rest of his days. He'll be as the very son of the king. We've received the adoption of sonship. But he's saying in verse number 5, Why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. Because God did all that once, just because I may have been on God's business, but I've been stuck in this mud puddle, doesn't mean that God's going to leave me in the mud puddle. I may have steered off the road in this chariot that God gave me and this new life that he blessed me with, this new creature. But if I ask him, he'll come and get me out of the mud. I may be trapped there, unable. That's why it's called a trap, because it works. It wouldn't be called a snare if it didn't snare you. A bear cannot get itself out of a bear trap. It would take somebody coming along that was either strong enough or smart enough to undo the trap. I'm neither, but God is. 
He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows all. He has all power. There's nothing that can hold us if God shows up and says, let him go. Isn't that what he said when Lazarus was raised from the dead? Loose him and let him go. What did he do? He undid the snare that Lazarus had. That was a snare of death. He took away the sting of death. I never did feel that. Hallelujah. Grave has no power. That was just one of them. We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Same three things he tempted Jesus with. Same three things that he you know, used to tempt Eve to sin. Same thing that caused Adam to embrace his wife and reject God. What is it? Lust of the eyes. Things that look good and draw us away from God. Lust of the flesh. Things that feel good and draw us away from God. And the pride of life is what keeps us in the trap. We don't want to admit that we were wrong and it keeps us separated from God. Eve didn't want to admit that she didn't remember what God had told him. Adam didn't want to admit that he loved what God gave him more than God himself. Abraham, by faith, believed that if he sacrificed Isaac on the altar that God raised him up from the dead. Adam didn't want to believe that God would give him another Eve if he rejected Eve. So instead, he embraced the sin of the person that he loved. He didn't want to admit that Eve was wrong. That that wrongness would lead him to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden. She gave unto him and he did eat. What did he do? He ensnared himself for the rest of his life. He lived over 900 years. But that snare brought him to death. That snare cost him a son. That snare changed for all of eternity the relationship between man and God. But there is one that could undo that snare. The second Adam, Christ. He's saying, I will, hope, I will yet praise him, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance. You know what your countenance is? That's your outlook. That's your personality. That's your demeanor. That's how you live your life. He's saying, God came and got me the first time. God can come and get me again. I'll just keep hoping in God. And I just, I believe with all my heart that if I do mess up again, He'll come and get me again. Because if I truly repent of it, what did Jesus say? That if a brother commit a fault or a sin against us, and he repent seven times in a day, we're supposed to forgive him every time. He may have done something different each of those seven times, but if he's truly repenting of it, we're supposed to take him back, forgive him. Why? Because repentance is desiring to get back what was lost. God understands that if we are truly repentant, that we turn from it, purpose never to do it again, we put it on the altar and burned it and said, Lord, I'm done with it. If we're sincere about it, we'll get closer to God. And Jesus, in his example, to the Pharisee, Simon, said if a master were to forgive one that had a certain debt and one that had a greater debt, which one would appreciate it more? Well, probably the one that was forgiven the bigger debt. We appreciate the grace of God more every time that we repent and get back to the Father's house. Amen. God understands that eventually we'll appreciate it so much that we'll stop leaving the Father's house. So I'll continue to hope in God. I'll praise Him even when I don't deserve to, you know, I'm not worth the powder to take a blow away, let alone the bullet. I understand that. But I'll praise Him because He cares about one as lowly as I. I'll praise Him because He came to me when I couldn't come to Him. I'll praise Him because He's undone a whole lot of snares. Well, what's that do? That increases my faith because I know what God's done in the past. I'll just believe that He can do whatever He wants to do. But then He says, I will praise the health of my countenance. Why is it healthy for our countenance? To be on God because we get that joy back. We get that praise back. We get the love for the things of God, for the people of God. The love for sinners that are like us or what we used to be. Because I see their snare and I say, I know God can help them with that. He helped me with that. Hey, I can point you in the right direction for that. You know why that's healthy for your countenance? You have become the light that God once sent your way. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. What are those things? We become like Him when He made us that new creature so that we can go out and be to others what God sent somebody to be to us. I may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads because I'm a written epistle known and read of all men. 
But if I've got His Word in my heart, I can shine a light. If I've got on His robes, I'll reflect the light that He has. Because my righteousness is filthy rags. But if He robes me in His righteousness, I can get pretty shiny. I mean, I've said it before. Our job is it's not to become you know, the biggest light bulb in the world. I'm just supposed to be a mirror. If I keep that mirror clean, I'll reflect the light of Him pretty good as long as I'm facing Him. If I'm pointed in the right direction, I'll shine as bright as Jesus. Not because I'm anything special, but just because I'm keeping the surface clean. Keeping anything from getting between me and Him so that I reflect the light. Because if a mirror gets dirty enough, it won't shine a light no more. It won't reflect what it's pointed at. You can be in the right spot, in the right place, look in the right direction, but if there's something in the way, if we don't get back to that altar, we won't shine. And our countenance will change. We won't look like a mirror anymore. We'll look like a dirty piece of glass. We won't act like a mirror anymore. We're just something that's in the way. We can't salt the earth and preserve it. Instead, we become part of the degenerate world where the mirror starts rusting. It starts decaying. And people say, why would I want anything to do with that? Right, what's the last part? He says, I shall yet praise him who's the health of my county and my God. Twice. Once in verse number 3 and, or once in verse number 4 at the very end and once at the end of verse number 5. That's where he embraces service. Where he allows, he, the whole time he's saying God is God. He's saying where I'm at doesn't change who God is. But Verse 1, 2, and 3, we don't find anything about his God. He just says God. Verses 4 and 5, he becomes submissive and says, not only is he God, he's the Lord of my life. They saying, God, I understood where I went wrong. I'll take you back. I've already decided that you're the God of all creation. But if you'll have me, I'll come back and I'll serve you. You'll be my God again. I mean, also several times in the book of Psalms, you'll find the God of my salvation well God has salvation but it's not yours unless you accept it God's not your God unless you accept his terms which are his way his path the world's got a path it's wide it leads to destruction there's a straight and narrow one that if we get on it we can live pleasing unto God God can be delighted in our life and we will have the strength of God we will have the reinforcement of God. I'll never get over that message Brother Jeffrey preached on. God's got my back. Right? When I'm standing there waiting for the Red Sea to part, He'll be behind me keeping the enemy off of my back so that I can make it long enough to cross and go where God wants me to go. Amen. That end of the day, He'll go before me as a pillar of cloud. By night, He'll go before me as a pillar of fire. When needful, He'll have my back so that I can fight the enemy or face what's in front of me. My God. You know what happened to those that didn't embrace him as their God? Moses and a bunch of the Levites, they went from one side of the camp to the other and they slew them that weren't on the Lord's side. If you rebel long enough, God will take you out of this world. You rebel long enough, you may be stuck in that you know, muck and mire of your situation because not because God doesn't want to forgive you because you're too stubborn to admit that you were wrong, too prideful to ask and repent, to say, Lord... Let me put it on the altar. Because Paul said that he'd deliver some over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. But regardless of why you find yourself in a sinful world, surrounded by sinful people, this psalmist figured it out, thankfully before it was too late, that no matter where I'm at, God can take care of it. I don't even really need to make it back to him because I know that he can reach down and get me where I'm at here and take me to the Father's house. Sometimes I may have to walk back, but if I've been crippled by a fall, he may just send somebody my way with the king's chariot and take me back to the house of God. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.